Well, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to uh, see such a packed audience for this really important conference, which is about, I think, uh, demonstrating the, both the interest, uh, the optimism, but above all, the ambition of Croydon. And I, I know that you're going to be in for a very interesting day. I'm going to obviously talk about how uh, the mayor and uh, the GLA uh, sees Croydon and its future uh, in a moment. Before doing so, I just really want to reflect for a moment on the nature of strategic government in London. Here's a photograph of our mayor, uh, probably breaking two laws at least. Uh, um, it's 10 years since the uh, mayor and the GLA were created. And I think over that period of time, the institution has come of age. If you cast your mind back to the days before London governance was uh, revived by the last government, you'll recall that in those days, uh, 10, 12 years ago, the debate was about whether London could compete against other major European cities like Frankfurt, or whether we were inevitably going to decline. And there was a real sense that London lacked a strategic voice, it lacked uh, a strategic focus. There was no go-to agency or person to get things done if you wanted to invest. There was nobody trying to get a grip of important services uh, and making the demands for investment and things like transport. There was a real sense of fragmentation in London, which the business community and the private sector in particular uh, thought very worrying. And then uh, the institutions were created. And 10 years later, I think both the current mayor and his predecessor have demonstrated that this is an institution that has really helped London in its fantastic journey, powering to what I still believe is the major world city. And if you compare all the dynamics, it really is a competition between London and New York. And over the last few years, I think London has had the edge. And one of the reasons for that is the ability of the Mayor of London to provide that strategic focus, particularly through the three key plans, the London plan, the Mayor's transport strategy, and the Mayor's economic development strategy. And I want to really uh, underline, I think, the importance of those at a time when there is a growing debate, not just a debate, a growing, I think, determination and direction to move towards localism. And localism means many things uh, to different people. And I think one of the concerns I would have is whether the move towards localism, which I do support, if not handled well, could actually take London back to a period where there was a lack of strategic uh, management and, and leadership. And I hope that doesn't happen. I'm sure uh, there are many people who would try to avoid that because localism has to be viewed in different contexts. There is, of course, things that are local to a neighbourhood where you'd really want decisions to be taken at a neighbourhood level. There's local to a borough level. Um, but there's also something which we call local to London. There are things which are important for London as a whole, and it is necessary that you have a mayor who's able to take those decisions, balancing the greater needs of London overall against any specific local issues. And for that reason, the mayor has quite wide-ranging powers in planning. He can uh, direct refusal of applications that are sent to him, but also he has the power to take over applications. It's a very significant power, and therefore one that the current mayor has used only very sparingly twice in the two years that he has been in office, uh, where he has, in a sense, overridden um, a local refusal of a planning application to actually give it approval because he believed that that was in the wider interests of London. It would only happen on the most strategic and important decisions, but it is a power which I think is necessary. Um, why am I bothering you with all of these things? And that's really because there is a debate, and I think it will soon be made public, that the government is planning to change the planning thresholds by which or over which types of schemes the mayor uh, has a role in. And this will res result in a reduction in the number of planning applications that are dealt with by the mayor. That is not something that I think we need to be too concerned about. I think there are uh, a number of types of schemes 
which frankly are not sufficiently strategic, that do come to the mayor. But nevertheless, I think we need to be mindful that there is a, an overall ambition and important need here for London that should never be forgotten. Now, one of the most important plans that the mayor is responsible for is the London plan, which is our regional spatial strategy. You'll be aware that last week, the High Court threw something of a spanner in the works of the government by um, allowing a judicial review uh, against the uh, Secretary of State's decision to scrap regional spatial strategies. Now, this is not an issue which affects us in London because we were allowed to continue with our strategy, the London plan, um, and therefore that is what we have been doing. And that, I think, gives a great element of certainty. The new London plan is uh, reaching the end of its lengthy examination in public. There's only a couple of days more to go. I think three issues left to uh, go through, including the sort of contentious things like uh, gypsy and traveller targets, uh, aggregates, and the operation of the community infrastructure levy. So that, that, that's, if you like, the tail end of the process. Uh, we, were expect, we will expect the inspector's report early next year with a view, hopefully, to it being adopted uh, late in 2011. Um, and if you believe in uh, a, taking a strategic view of London, as both uh, Boris and his predecessor, Ken Livingstone, did, then there are several things that will continue. But in the new London plan, which uh, Boris Johnson has, is bringing forward, there are some very key differences from that of his predecessor. A much greater focus on outer London, on quality of life, on sustainable suburbs, on balancing growth with maintaining local character and sense of place, and in stressing the important role of local town centres. There are also, of course, new facts on the ground that need to be taken account of in planning London in the future, most notably Crossrail, which we're delighted uh, is going to go ahead and has survived the comprehensive spending review, but also, of course, the Olympics and the important Olympic legacy. So much more emphasis on place shaping, on neighbourhoods and communities, more emphasis on local context and character in both architecture and in public spaces. Now, London is a city that is growing. Its population is growing very quickly, and we have to think about where that growth can best be accommodated, both in terms of housing and jobs. And so the London plan identifies a number of both opportunity areas and intensification areas. And this, I think, is an, exe uh, an excellent example of positive uh, spatial planning. We are producing a number of what we call opportunity area planning frameworks in partnership with boroughs in places such as Vauxhall, Nine Elms Battersea, White City, Park Royal, the Upper Lee Valley, and the area around the Olympics. And these frameworks are grounded in the statutory planning system. They are supplementary guidance to the London plan, but they're only produced in partnership with and in support, uh, with the support of the boroughs, local landowners, and stakeholders. And they help give a spatial dimension to the London plan. And what they do is to enable the capacity of London's largest brownfield sites to really be examined to see what can be developed. And in each of these opportunity areas, as we go through them, we un unlock much greater capacity for growth than um, would at first uh, appear. They are propositional about land use, about transport, and master planning. And they look at things such as where are the uh, appropriate locations for tall buildings uh, in an, an area. They're flexible. The point is not to be overly prescriptive, but to have a key focus on delivery by giving certainty to developers and to local stakeholders about what can be developed. And critically, they are accompanied by transport studies to ensure there's a good fit between development and transport capacity. Now, these opportunity area planning frameworks uh, can be funded in different ways. In some cases, we have been able to uh, take 
uh, contributions from developers on a no-strings basis to ensure that the work can be brought forward and expedited. Good examples of that are in Vauxhall, uh, Nine Elms, and in White City. In other locations, that's either not appropriate or it's not possible because of the nature of land ownership. And in those areas, there is a role for the public sector to actually step in and fund the preparation of these planning frameworks. And in the case of Croydon, uh, even now, when there is limited funding available, uh, the mayor feels that Croydon is such an important location, has such strategic importance for uh, London's future, that he's been prepared, uh, despite having most of his budgets cut, to uh, invest in making sure that there is a good opportunity area planning framework for Croydon. That's partly what we'll be discussing today.